Coming up next, it's Floss Weekly with me, Randall Schwartz, and our new co-host, Randy Harper. We're going to talk to Sean Pierce, who's managing the Garrett software project to manage large Git repos. Be sure to watch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Randy Harper, episode 118 for April 26, 2010. Garrett. It's time for Floss Weekly, the weekly show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz. With me today is my new co-host. Uh, you've seen her before. You've heard her before. If you've been following the show for a while, it's none other than uh, many know her as Free BSD Girl. We know her as Randy Harper. Welcome to the show, Randy. Thanks, Randall. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are at a new time slot. Uh, I'm I'm sort of manning the ship now because Leo has moved on to bigger and better things. No, just different things, not better things, just different things. And so uh, I'm managing the show, getting that all taken on. And I'm, uh, I've got Randy on as a co-host for today's show. Um, in fact, uh, I, I do want to th- say, though, without uh, making sure that we get this in the, in the beginning of the show here, is I really appreciate John O'Bacon having done uh, probably 40 or 50 shows with me now. Uh, but when we moved to the new time slot, it was really like right in the middle of when he normally has a morning conference calls. But we moved to the new time slot partially so that we could be better, uh, more um, convenient to our European guests. We have a lot of European guests on this show because open source is worldwide. And so by moving to an earlier slot in the day, um, it'll be easier for our Europe people to be on there. And unfortunately, eh, Jono can't quite make it that show. But so, Randy, you're, you're up early. You're up for this show. Oh, is this the normal time you're awake or are you? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I'm usually not awake <laughs> until like noon. I go to sleep around five in the morning. Oh, OK. So but and, and I did you say you hadn't even been to sleep today or what? Well, no, with the big news I got last night, I've been busy going through sys install and working on stuff for my employer and then trying to prepare for this. Yeah, what was the big news? Um, I got my FreeBSD commit bit, so it's something I've been working towards for a while, and now I finally have the questionable task of working on sys install full time. Oh, wow. So that's a, it's, it's a blessing and a curse because now you actually have to do some work, huh? Yeah, I've gotten many, many condolences from other FreeBSD developers. <laughs> well, good. You'll be making changes in the thing that I'm using every day on my on my servers now, thanks to you. So uh, now, happy FreeBSD user now. Um, also, just to, just to cover a little more history before we get into the guest for today, um, I uh, last week's guest, uh, Bob Jacobs, said, if you haven't heard that show and you're just picking the show up in the, as this is your first show, go back and listen to last week's show because Bob Jacobson. You know, as I said in the closing of last week, we took one for the team. He really spent a lot of his energy and time for six years uh, really just, you know, fighting the good fight to make sure that open source licenses uh, were validated, even though there's no money changing hands. Uh, did you get a chance to listen to that show, Randy? I did listen to it this morning. Um, I managed to catch most of it. It was normally, honestly, I find Pat and Top kind of boring, but this was just completely gripping. It was a horrifying story, but it's great that he it turned out as well as it did. Yeah, yeah, and just it's, it is amazing because it could, it could have gone a lot worse. Could have gone a lot worse. So uh, anything else you want to say before we get into our guest already? Uh, no, I'm good to go. Okay, great. So this week we have on um, a Sean Pierce. Sean Pierce has been the project lead for the Garrett Code Review project. Now, Garrett Code Review is uh, a, a modification of Git. It sits on top of Git or something like that. We'll have to figure out, uh, ask him how that all works together. But um, it, Git, you might remember from our show all the way back, I think it was three years ago, back when I just barely had started doing this job, uh, we interviewed uh, Huni Hammond, who's uh, the current uh, project leader for Git, which is a source code management software system. And Garrett Code Review takes that to the next level by allowing a Git repository to be managed for um, having multiple people uh, like vote on and sign off on various changes that are going to be made, which is solving a very important problem when you have a distributed uh, project like this. And uh, I understand Garrett's being used for some very large projects. It was actually invented, I think, for the Google Android project. Uh, are you familiar with Android, um, Randy? Oh, yeah. I started with the G1. I have the Droid. I've been running Android for a while. 
Yeah, I just have an iPhone. So, and actually, somebody said they they were going to send me an Android. So I stopped talking about my iPhone. But uh, I'll give you the address if you want it. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. So uh, this was uh, so uh, Sean apparently is working with the uh, Android people to produce. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the Garrett code reviews so that people can actually upload their changes and get things voted on. So let's go to Sean right now. Sean Pierce, hello, welcome to the show. Morning. Yeah. So uh, where are we speaking to you from? I'm in Mountain View at the Googleplex. Oh, really? Cool. All right. You, you work for Google? Yes. Oh, very nice. Very nice. So uh, I briefly covered what Garrett was in the opening of the show, but uh, what, let's hear it from you. What's uh, what? What is Garrett all about? Garrett's about providing a code review system for developers to review their work and uh, figure out whether it's worth including in the project or not. And if it's not, to be able to comment on it and address whatever concerns might be uh, related to that work and fix it before it gets into the code base. So when a lot of people are working together to produce software, obviously it has to be brought together at some point. Uh, Git has obviously been helpful for that for people doing like Linux kernel, Linux kernel development and things like that. Uh, so this is this is based on Git? Is, is that the core of it? Yeah, so Garrett Code Review built on top of the foundation that Git provides. Uh, Linus Torvalds has been famous for saying Git's not a version control system. It's really a version control construction kit. Mm -hmm. And Garrett Code Review sort of takes this to heart and built its own tooling on top of Git. So it really only works for Git-based projects. Okay, so we have Git to manage uh, people making branches and building their own commits and moving the project forward separately, and Git also manages bringing it back together. Does does Garrett get in, in the middle of that somehow? Does it keep people from merging things too early or something? Yeah, so what Garrett lets you do is you work on your code in a branch in Git, just like you would if you were working in Git normally. But then you can upload it to the Garrett server, and other people can browse it on the web and can write comments about it. But this is all before it's gone into the code base. Mm. And then once people have voted on it and said, this code looks good, it's ready to go in the code base, Garrett will enable a button that lets you merge it into your master branch for the, the code or your experimental branch or wherever you want it to go. So unlike normally with Git workflows where you're merging stuff locally in your own repo and then pushing the resulting commit back up to a server, Garrett's actually letting you do the merge on server side. Yes. Now what we happens if there's conflicts? We, conflicts get handled back on the developer desktop. Garrett will alert you that there's a conflict here and ask you to download the code and merge it locally. Mm. But once that merge is done, you can upload the merge and have the merge review just like any other development process. Wow, uh, this sounds cool because I know that one of the things that's been missing in Git, as sort of Git native, is like this sort of additional level of uh, review process. How, how did this come about? What's what's uh, what, what's the history of Garrett? So it's actually quite a long history. The short part is when Google open sourced the Android operating system, the Google engineers using uh, developing Android were very used to using Google Mondrian, mm -hmm. and they were losing it when we open sourced and switched from Perforce to Git and started doing a lot of development in the open, or at least attempting to do development in the open, except patches from the community. So we went and built Garrett Code Review to fill that gap of what happens when you lose Google Mondrian. But Google Mondrian is a much older history. Uh, Guido von Rossum, when he first joins the uh, company, Google, and Guido, of course, is famous for his work on Python. Mm -hmm. when, when Guido chose uh, to join Google, we asked him to work on a starter project. Every developer has to work on a starter project when they come here. And he spent, uh, I don't know, six months building this web-based peer code review tool called Google Mondrian. Mm -hmm. And after he got it built, he uh, gave a tech talk on it, and people can uh, go find that video if they would like to, to find it. Mm -hmm. But the engineers got really addicted to this Google Mondrian tool because it improved their uh, productivity. They could make their changes, get it peer code reviewed from people in the different cities even, and get it into the code base really quickly. And how does that work? Uh, how does it work from a distributed point of view? Do you, so the, the review isn't really happening real time then. The review is just happening by people putting comments in some server then. Yes, yes. Yeah, Google Mondrian, there's a single central server that stores the comments and offers up a web interface. Everybody visits that server. And, and the server, of course, is hosted at Mountain View, so folks in Mountain View get good access to it, and folks in the other cities sort of suffer mm. global internet traffic latencies. Garrett Code Review takes the same approach. Uh, unlike Git being very distributed, Garrett centralizes all the review data to one server. 
So people know, if I need to do a review, go to this website. It's there for that project. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Mondrian was similar in interface then? It's, it was a web-based interface to, to uh, access the, uh, the, 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 the various branches and commits and able to view them? Yeah, if you look at the tech talk Guido gave, he even shows screenshots of it. There's a dashboard like you might have in a issue tracker that shows you, here's the things you're working on, here's the things you need to review, uh, here's stuff that's kind of old that maybe you should get back to. And then you can drill down from those to actually look at the file and look at the code side by side from the old version to the new version. And then write comments on a particular line of code and you can see a thread on that line of a discussion between two engineers talking about how they can improve that code to make it suitable for inclusion fix a bug that is being introduced and so i have similar highlighted diffs like i would have say in uh, git k or any of the other gui interfaces yeah yeah you do get a highlighted diff but git k only shows you a unified diff style, so it shows you sort of the lines around your change and mm -hmm. shows a minus of what you're removing and a plus of what you're adding. And it doesn't do a great job of telling you this code got moved in the file or it doesn't do a great job of telling you within a line that you're replacing, he actually only touched the. Maybe he changed the typo from T-E-H to T-H-E. Okay. And, and Guido... So uh, in Mondrian introduced uh, not just showing side by side, but you can see the actual intraline difference. What it, it highlights what characters were modified in that line. Oh, that's much better for the interface, and that's great. So um, I this is a this is a discussion system for accepting a patch. Is there also a, a tracking system in there as well, like a no. species tracker? No, we haven't built one for it. It sort of seems a natural interface that you'd want to use an issue tracker to keep track of your dashboard and what you need to work on. But we didn't want to go with trying to reinvent the whole issue tracking system. We thought it was sort of a soft problem at the time. Yeah, there's of about course, 17 solutions to that already. So Yes, exactly. Of course, there is no good distributed issue tracker. This keeps coming up on the Git mailing list over and over again. It, we would like a distributed issue tracker to go with our distributed source code system. And nobody's come up with a great solution for one. And I think we kind of maybe missed an opportunity there with Garrett that if we had done more issue tracking functionality into it and find a way to make that distributed that we could build a much better product than we have today. Now, so this is, so this is a, it's not, you're not actually using the real Git source code underneath. This is actually a re-implementation of Git, right? Yeah. So. Garrett Code Review is written in pure Java, and mm. Git is written in C, and some shell, and some Python. Well, actually, I think I got rid of the Python, but it's a bunch of different little Unix programs, and, and we Perl. didn't want to be forking there out. There yeah, there's Perl. There's definitely Perl. Um, and you would know. Yes. <laughs> but we didn't want to be forking out from a JVM to go execute small commands in uh, the Git toolkit just to perform activities in the version control system. So we're actually using a pure Java library that's a re-implementation of Git called JGit. And that project I started in early 2005, I think. It's been going mm. on a, almost five years now. And you've been with the Git project since almost the beginning, right? Almost. I came about a year after. So actually, Git started around 2005, if I remember right, and mm. I joined about 2006, I guess. So. Yeah, I was wrong. I started JGit around 2006, not 2005. So it's about four years old. You're about, no, no, you're not about four years old. The project's about four no, years old. The project's <laughs> about four years old. And Git itself is about five. <laughs> I was going to say, you look a little old for being four. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I age very rapidly. Apparently, apparently. That's what, that's what working with version control systems will do to you, though. <laughs> yes. So, so JGit, let's go back to that then. So JGit is an implementa independent implementation of the Git protocols, the Git object tree, the Git uh, merging protocols and everything then, huh? Yeah, it's a full implementation of not just the file formats on disk, but the algorithms needed to access it and process it in a version control-like way, and also the network protocols. We have a full implementation of uh, the Git native network protocol, the HTTP protocol, the new native HTTP protocol, and we use a Java-based SSH client even. So we don't even have to go out to open SSH to speak over SSH to talk to Git. Wow. So I don't even have like a separate web server or a separate SSH thing to do the uploads or anything like that, huh? 
No, so Garrett Code Review embeds a, uh, a Jetty web server, so it's a self-contained web server, but it also embeds a SSH server from the Apache Foundation called Mina SSHD. So it's mm -hmm. completely pure Java SSH server that authenticates against itself. It doesn't need to go to the host. You don't have to worry about adding user accounts to enable uploads. And this actually is a really effective for us because the Android open source uh, project, we have a public server running, and there's only really two users in the Unix Etsy password file that are permitted to uh, log in to manage the system. But we have thousands of people that have... Uh, given us their SSH keys and created SSH accounts in the Garrett code review system to upload their changes. And the reason that's important in the Git environment is because you, the Git doesn't really have a separate protocol for pushing uh, commits up to the server. It actually just uses the fact that you can SSH into a normal server to uh, do its job. Yeah, yeah. Git uh, decided why reinvent the wheel of authentication and security and encryption when there's this great SSH toolkit available and you just have to run the commands to tunnel your data through it. So that was actually one of the roadblocks we had early on with getting Garrett Code Review started was there wasn't a great SSH server available. The, the best one available is OpenSSH. And there certainly wasn't one available in Java that we could easily embed into a self-contained daemon like this. But fortunately, one came around uh, not too long ago, only six months, maybe a year old. And we were able to start embedding it and take advantage of it. But from the client side, it's great. You don't have to worry about installing uh, extra security software, worry about whether there's a security problem in Git. It's your SSH client on your machine. So what do I need to run this? I need to have a, a, something like Tomcat or something in my Apache to run this? Or is it stand no, it's standalone, right? So I don't even need yeah, that, Yeah, it's right? completely standalone. You uh, download the, the WAR file, but the WAR file is actually executable and contains a Jetty embedded server. So mm -hmm. it's got the web server already in it. It's got uh, the H2 database. So it's got a database server already built into it. Wow. And mm -hmm. it's got the the libraries it needs to talk to uh, Git, and it's got the mean SSH server built into it. So the install process is pretty simple. Install a JVM and install the, the download the jar file, run it, and it takes over from there. Do I need uh, Git installed as well to be able to create my, uh, my repos and stuff? So almost no. <laughs> unfortunately, there's one function. Unfortunately, there's one function in uh, Git that we re still require, and we're hoping to eliminate that in the near future. But you don't need it to create the repositories. What you need Git for is to actually generate the difference that we show online. Mm. JGit being a reimplementation in Java, we've uh, been missing that critical diff functionality for pretty much the whole life of the project, the past four years. Uh, Johannes Schinzlin finally was able to contribute the diff functionality to us, but we haven't finished gluing all of that together. So right now, we still fork out to run git diff tree on the commands line when we need to know what was modified. Now, uh, Garrett being a, a Google project, I guess then, uh, was this motivated by a particular project within Google to uh, be able to do this? It was really motivated by the Android open source project choosing to version control in Git when they left Perforce. And then we suddenly had a very large number of Google engineers that work on that project screaming, I want my Google Mondrian back, and you're making me use this Git thing? Please help me. I want my Google Mondrian back. So we couldn't give a Mondrian. Mondrian is uh, very tied to NFS and to Perforce and to our wonky LDAP environment, and it's really not useful to anybody. But fortunately, uh, Guido had open sourced at least the critical bits of Mondrian in a project he calls Rietfeld Code Review okay. that runs on Google App Engine. So we, Garrett Code Review sort of started by taking Rietfeld Code Review and forking it and trying to provide the missing functionality that the Android team said they wanted specifically that wasn't already there. And they sort of took it, unfortunately, as a, well, we want Google Mondrian, but oh, since you're reinventing the wheel anyway, can you go ahead and add some extra things to it for us? Mm. So the Android project is the biggest customer of this so far. Are other large projects using it as well? So, yeah, Android's the biggest customer of it, and it's not just the Google Android engineers using it. A lot of the larger integrators that build devices are using it. I know uh, Motorola has been pretty active, uh, at least in the discussion forum to some extent, about Garrett Code Review because they use it, I think, internally. Uh, I think HTC uses it internally. Uh, Sony Ericsson's been stepping up big time as a contributor to Garrett Code Review. Sony Ericsson's building uh, some Android devices, but some of their engineers are contributing back to Garrett now, which is great. Cool. And so outside of, outside of Android, uh, our adoption's much narrower. We're being used by OpenAFS, if I remember right. 
Mm -hmm. uh, OpenAFS being the Andrew file system that came out of CMU and I, I don't know if they're a re-implementation or not, but uh, OpenAFS uses us and uh, the Eclipse Foundation is considering adoption. Mm, wow. So, um, so I have a question ahead. for you. Um, it looks like I was reading through your history and, and it seems like this was originally based on a project that worked around subversion. So is this specific to Git? Or I mean, can you still use this with subversion? So Garrett Code Review now is very specific to Git. We started from uh, Readfield Code Review, which was based around subversion, you're right. And we forked it and started adding a bunch of functionality that uh, the Android engineers asked us to include. And by the time we got done, it became very Git specific. And then we kind of scrapped that code base and rewrote it from scratch. Uh, said, there's nothing really great here and carried it, uh, just started over. I think only a thousand lines of code survived out of the entire project when we did that rewrite. And now we're incredibly Git specific because we embed that uh, Git library and use it for all of our data storage. Now is, uh, is the Garrett project using itself to, I mean, is it eating its own dog food? Or is there actually a Garrett code review, Garrett code review? Yes, yes. We've been dog fooding uh, Garrett since essentially day one. We said, all right, we're going to fork Readfield code review. So uh, let's download the source code for that, upload it back to App Engine under our own application ID, and let's start using it to run itself. Mm. And when we started the rewrite, we uh, did the rewrite in the existing App Engine-based version, and as soon as the rewrite was ready to actually run traffic, we switched over to it. Cool, because that's a, that's a good test. I mean, I, I know when Git, Git was self-hosting from almost the beginning, so uh, it's good that Garrett was also pretty much in that category as well. Yeah, I think it's a huge test of your project. Can you start using your project from the earliest days? If you can't, then you're probably focusing on the wrong things. How do you know that it's going to really work the way you hope it's going to work? And for a version control system or a code review system, one of the most obvious ways to do this is to use it for itself. Now, how does, I'm not that familiar with Java developing. How does Git integrate with developing Java? Is there like plugins for Eclipse or something? Or how does, how does that all work out? So J gets started as a library to let us create a plugin for Eclipse. The uh, Eclipse IDE is written in Java, and if you want to write a plugin for it, you pretty much have to write your user interface extensions or whatever on Java. And we said, well, we might as well also just write Git in Java while we're at it. Okay, and so and so the a, a developer is going to be sitting in front of an Eclipse IDE doing their work day by day, and then push some button that says push it up to Garrett for review. Yeah, so right now the eGit plugin for Eclipse provides uh, at least rudimentary push support. You can say uh, right-click on your project, push this to, type in the URL, or pick it from a remembered remote that you've already stored in Git, and then mm -hmm. it uh, has a little wizard that shows you the progress and tells you when it's done. Um, it's not really integrated with Garrett to say uh, the extra bit that we need in the push command that says to Garrett, oh, this is for code review versus just dump it into the project. But I think Mylan, uh, Mylan is a plugin for Eclipse that tries to do task integration management, like issue tracker management. I think mm -hmm. Mylan is looking at adding some functionality to Mylan to make that easier, make it fewer clicks to upload to Garrett. If I remember, there's something like you push it to a, a different named branch to be able to trigger the review functions. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, took advantage of the fact that Git allows for an infinite number of branches in a single repository and mm -hmm. that the branch namespace is very open. Uh, you know, Git has refs heads as this prefix it uses for regular branches, what they call branches, and then refs tags for a different area where they store tags. But that's really kind of it. There, that whole subdirectory under refs is really kind of open. So Garrett created this little magical land called refs4. And when you push something to refs4, Garrett doesn't actually put it there, but it uses that as a magic token to recognize, oh, he wants me to start a code review. I'll go off and do my magic to create a code review for him. Wow. And uh, in, a, in a practical sense, how does the workflow then work with that? So basically, I'm developing as a local developer. I have a, a new, a new uh, commit that I'd like people to start looking at. I'm pushing it to this specially named branch to do that. And then, and then some sort of period of days or weeks comes after that. I mean, how's the Android project work with that? So you uh, 
you type in your git push, the Garrett server URL, this little refs4 uh, bit, instead of saying uh, push master, you say push my master to refs4 master. And Garrett spits back a URL uh, as the output of the commands. You can see it right there in your console. It says, here's your code review with the URL to it. But it'll also send out an email to people that watch that project. You can go online, uh, find the project, and say, send me notice of any new changes that get uploaded for consideration in this project. And typically with uh, Android, people who are involved in a particular component of Android that develop on it daily or work on it have registered interest and will get this alert in their inbox. But they can also go online and browse through the dashboard and see, oh, there's stuff uploaded for this project. What's the granularity for notifications? Is it on or off, or is there some sort of, can I say, only things that affect this part of the tree? Unfortunately, it's right now only on or off per Git repository. Mm -hmm. And Android is, I don't know, maybe 200 Git repositories now. It's oh, okay. really broken up across a bunch of things. So you can at least say at this project level or at this Git repository level, but unfortunately, you can't go to a directory or a file within it. We'd really like okay. to add that feature, but we just haven't gotten there. Yeah, I mean, you can't have all the features and release one. That doesn't make any right, sense. Right, right. So, so uh, I would, I, now the URL that comes back, is that something that I would then paste in some mail channel or something or some, some email list to say, hey, I'm, I've got this particular feature or? Yeah, you totally can. The URLs, uh, you know, what we consider a permalink URL, the URL is going to be stable for the life of that server, so long as that domain name is still running that server. But yeah, mm -hmm. you paste it into a uh, IRC channel or a chat message or throw it in an email and say, hey, Bob, why don't you take a look at this, uh, this particular URL? But you can also, if you want to specifically target to a particular person when you upload the URL, uh, upload your change for review, you can actually modify the commands that Git's going to run on the server by updating your uh, push commands line and adding an extra flag. Mm -hmm. And you can add extra arguments into Garrett that says, I want you to CC this individual, or I want you to add them as the reviewer immediately and make sure they get an email that says, hi, John Smith, I want you to look at this URL. And here it is. And here's my message of what I was working on. Oh, so using that modification, you could actually then say, uh, when I push, I could say this is part of like some sub part of the team needs to see this and I'll mail a mailing list address then. Yes, yeah. And actually, a number of Google engineers do that. Within Google, it's not uncommon to just say, hey, mailing list that works on this project with me, here's a new change. And then somebody on the mailing list will pick it up and go look at it. And there isn't a designated reviewer at the beginning of the change. Um, and if you get tired of typing this stuff in on the commands line, fortunately, Git allows you to add the uh, configuration of what command to run on the server as part of your .git config. So it's not uncommon for people to have Git remotes set up that are like uh, review to Bob, review to Sally, review hmm. to team mailing list, where each of them is basically the same Garrett URL, but a different uh, receive pack parameter in that config file that just specifies a different mailing list address or a different email address for Garrett to direct the review at. So it sounds like this is a pretty comprehensive tool. Is there anything else in this space that you were looking at to get ideas from? So there's a few other things in the area. Uh, not get specific, there's Review Board. Review Board's an open source project that I want to say they're written in maybe PHP, I don't remember. But uh, they're a web-based server that you can go to, have a dashboard, uh, view side-by-side -side changes, have a conversation in. But they're not Git specific. They support Mercurial, Subversion, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they don't support the voting and access control and auto server side merging that we do in Garrett. So a little different. And they don't do uh, repository managements like we do in Garrett. Uh, we do some features that Review Board just doesn't have. Um, in the Git space, there's like something like Gitosis or Gitolite. These are mm -hmm. two really popular repository management uh, libraries that are available or toolkits. And you install these under your normal OpenSSH server on your company internet server or whatever. And uh, all the users log into a single Git account by public SSH key. And then the Gitosis or the Gitolite product decides, can you see this repository? Can you write to it? And if you can write to it, then it'll pretty much let you upload whatever you choose to it. There's no review functionality integrated to it. There's no enforcement that says that in order for this change to get put into the stable branch, you need to have votes from at least two other developers recorded as part of that change. So you can build those kinds of rules into uh, into Garrett then, huh? So yeah, you can build these sorts of features into Garrett and it's just simple web interface that you can use to control who uh, has access to 
vote on a change and whether that vote is even required in order to put the change into the repository. And that was one of the features that was even missing in Rietveld code review, but is available in Google Mondrian. And it's one of the things that the Android team demanded we put back in because they want to make sure that everybody stays honest within the team, that they actually got a acknowledgement from somebody else in the group. And That's so groups... Cool. Groups that are, you know, more open source oriented, like Git itself or the Linux kernel itself, these acts are handled by the mailing list. You send your email to the mailing list, the patch gets reviewed on there, commented, torn to shreds, 52 revisions later, uh, Andrew Morton sticks an act by or signed off by on the bottom of it. And then finally, Linus accepts it because Andrew Morton's got his act on it or whatever. We wanted to f formalize this and put it into a web-based system so you have to track a mailing list and make it a, a record that was easily available to anybody interested in the project. Now, what sort of a tracking system are you using with uh, Android then? Because you said the Garrett doesn't do it. So what, what kind of a external tracking system do you have? So the Android open source project is using the Google Code issue tracker on uh, okay. code.google.com. And that's actually what Garrett Code Review is using as well. Uh, back in the early days of Garrett Code Review, we actually had purchased a Jira uh, issue tracker license and was using Atlassian's Jira's product. And we were using that because we thought we might want to use it for Android too, but the Android engineers just weren't too fond of it. And we got a lot of issues uh, racked up in the Google Code tracker. And so we said, well, we'll just stick with Google Code. Cool. And is there any kind of direct integration then? Do, do you paste like the, the Google issue tracker number into uh, commits and things like that? So... There's very little integration right now. Yeah, we stick the issue tracker number into the commit message kind of in the bottom and say like bug colon issue 52 uh, mm -hmm. right above a signed off by line in our commit message. But all that's really giving us right now is a hyperlink in Garrett Code Review back to the Google Code issue tracker. There's no notice that when that change is submitted that the issue should be marked as fixed or closed in the issue tracker. An issue tracker doesn't get a comment saying, though, there's a code review posted. You should, uh, if you're interested in this bug, you should go look at that code review. So we don't have that reverse direction in place yet. Uh, but just this morning on the mailing list, a uh, guy from Sony Ericsson said he wants to start working on that uh, reverse uh, integration and is hopefully going to start doing that in the near future. Very cool. So at least though it does, it, it, it turns like a text message that says uh, issue 45 into an actual link that goes back to the to whatever tracker I want? Yeah, that's a, a configurable. It's based off regular expressions matching on the message text and then uh, the web interface turns that into a hyperlink that you can click on and make that jump in your browser. Sounds like there's a, quite a bit of features in here. To, I, I, can't, I can't imagine doing this all by hand anymore with stuff like this around. Yeah, most people, once they start using it, are like, why would I want to go back to using an email system to track changes or uh, comment on code? And yeah, it does simplify it quite a bit. Well, it's, it's like once you once you discover Git, it's like going back to, you know, SVN or something seems like a step back in the, into the 90s. Yeah, and then uh, once you discover Garrett, it's sort of the same thing because why fight with Git format patch and Git send email to send your eighth iteration to the mailing list and then try to review the eighth iteration and see what's different from the seventh that you reviewed last and what your notes were. Garrett keeps it all online for you. You can easily correlate the seventh iteration with the eighth and it's easy to upload the change for a contributor. It's Git push. How hard is that? Everybody knows how to use GitHub and Git push to GitHub. Garrett code review is basically the same. Has uh, Junio uh, shown any uh, interest in using this for the Git project itself? So we haven't had any conversations about it, and I think he's kind of happy with his mailing list workflow, but it may just be a lot of momentum. Everybody that contributes to Git is familiar with uh, Git format patch and send email at this point, and, you know, we were talking about dogfooding your uh, own tools earlier. If we started using Garrett Code Review for managing Git, then we're not using Git format patch and Git send email anymore to manage Git. Mm. Uh, you know, it would be nice if they... Uh, wanted to use it. I would certainly appreciate it as a Git contributor myself. It makes it a lot easier to contribute code and remember what I need to fix up before I resubmit something to Junio for inclusion. But I think there's some hurdles socially to uh, adopting it. So how many people are actually working on Garrett Code Review then? Uh, it's obviously you and a small group uh, of other interested people. There, 
Let's see. There's uh, about half of my time actually goes to Garrett Card Review. Uh, Google, fortunately, allows me to work on it during my day job. And mm -hmm. there's another engineer uh, here at Google working on it about the same amount, about half time. And there's some folks over at Sony Ericsson working on it. I don't know exactly how many, but it seems to be around three or four folks uh, contributing at least some of their time to some patches Sony Ericsson cares about. And that's about it. Uh, there's a few sporadic one-off patches from folks. You know, you get any open source project, somebody comes along and looks at it and says, oh, this does everything I need except let me hack that up real quick and upload it. And so we've got, you know, maybe 10 or 20 other contributors if you look at our stats on Oholo. But uh, most of them are these small five, six lines of code change that they quickly hacked out. Cool. We're still a young project. And are you looking for more contributors to Garrett? Oh, absolutely. There, our issue tracker is full of great ideas and not enough people to actually carry them out. And I'm sure there's a lot more great ideas that haven't been documented in issue tracker yet. So the most important great idea right now is? The most important great idea we've got is we want to actually make Garrett distributed. We built on top of this great distributed version control system, Git, and it allows the peer-to-peer -peer operation with no concept of central server. But you can't really take all the Garrett code review data and pull it onto your laptop and then use it on a plane. And yes, planes are getting Wi-Fi, but last time I used it, it was slow and expensive and wasn't the best way to do a code review on a plane. Yeah. And it would be nice if we could actually pull our code reviews onto our laptops and carry it with us just like we carry our Git history. So you can't right now just take all of the data below a Garrett installation and move it to, like, or sync it to a laptop and use it? Unfortunately, no, because all of the common information, all the metadata that's used to drive the dashboards and what the votes are is stored in a SQL database. Mm, okay, so that's not going to work so well then. So it's not going to work so well, no. And forget trying to merge that back up to the central server when uh, you come back online after your flight. We'd much prefer this to store all that data in Git and let Git handle that merging and let Git handle that synchronization between your laptop and the server. And to install this, like I think we said this already, but just to make sure I've covered this, so you just basically download a, a WAR file and run that, and that's pretty much it? Yeah, it's a WAR file, so if you wanted to use a different servlet uh, server, you could embed it into that, but it's a self-executable. -ex you download it and just Java minus jar, the name of the file, and let it run. Wow. And then you set up the users and everything. Is there like a, there must be some sort of user management to be able to control who can upload and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So the user management is actually, uh, there's two different options really available there. The first one is to use OpenID authentication, and that's the default out of the box. And we chose that because everybody and their brother can get an OpenID pretty easily. There's a lot of OpenID provider websites like myopenid.net or something. And uh, every Google account is an OpenID, and every Yahoo account is an OpenID, and I think every Facebook account and every live journal blog and Everybody and their dog has an open ID these days. So yes. we thought that was a great way to let people manage uh, yet another account on the web for yet another server that they have to visit, but not need to remember uh, username and password and everything. But the other option you can use is uh, authentication against an LDAP directory. And mm -hmm. we really built that because Garrett's had a lot of traction inside of companies. Uh, download it, install it on a company server. It can't talk to the internet. We can't let our trade secrets leak out but we still need to authenticate our users and uh, make sure that it's really Bob that's the one voting for inclusion of a change to our code base. So we support linking up to LDAP, but we don't support a uh, arbitrary username password uh, storage system. And unfortunately, this meant that in one particular Garrett server, I had to uh, install open LDAP on the machine just to get a username and password storage system in place. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, but if I have something like a, like, um, a uh, yeah, something I'm doing is internal to a company. I can just wire it up to the company's LDAP server then. Oh, yeah. It wires up pretty easily to the LDAP servers. It auto-detects whether you're ch uh, talking to a Microsoft Active Directory or a more traditional open LDAP schema. And based on that auto-detection uh, during startup, most likely configures itself. So you just have to type in your URL and uh, you know what the LDAP server hostname is. And so then that... Uh, the me as the installer then would become like the sort of the uber administrator of the of the uh, particular repo and uh, can i delegate administration to other users yeah so there's a uh, administrators group built into garrett that sort of provides uh pseudo like rights to unix uh but within the garrett context if you're an administrator group you can 
uh, create other user groups. You can put users in them, take them out, and uh, control what projects are present on the server and who has access to those. But at a Git repository level, that project level, you can delegate who can manage that repository to another group. And groups can control who's in them and who isn't. So like for the Android open source projects, we've actually delegated control for a number of the projects to non-Google companies that have contributed projects. Uh, a TI driver for a TI chipset, TI manages that project. Although I manage that server, I've delegated control of that particular area to somebody else. So this means like in, say, in a, like my client's location here, I could have one instance of Garrett installed and then be, the 10 different projects that would need to use it could all uh, coexist. Yeah, and this actually appears to be very common for companies to do. Uh, one team is responsible for running the server, backups of that server, and then they just delegate out to the individual project groups what they, uh, th their areas of the server for them to manage on their own. I'm just thinking about this then. So do you need a point in time backups because you're using uh, some sort of SQL database? Yeah, so backups are probably not as good as they should be. Uh, the Git repository, obviously, you just back up the Git repository directory. But the database server, whatever database you're using, you're going to have to do some sort of point in time snapshot of that database product. And right now we support three databases, H2, uh, which we manage ourselves inside the Garrett process. And back that up, unfortunately, I think you have to actually shut down the Garrett server and then copy the, the database files out. Um, Postgres, you can uh, enable snapshotting on the Postgres server, snapshot the database and restore it to standard Postgres management. And we also support MySQL. And again, there, MySQL's got backup management tools. So most production servers that are handling thousands of users and uh, hundreds and hundreds of changes going through them per day that are business critical for a development team are running on a Postgres or a MySQL backend so that they can easily do these snapshots. So that was sort of my next question too. Uh, large projects using this, is this, is this, do you consider this stable now? Is it ready for prime time? Yeah, we've been running it. Uh, this particular uh, rewrite of Garrett has been live in production use since January of 2009. Mm -hmm. Mid-January, we switched over to this code base, and uh, it's been in production not just for Google and the Android Open Source Project, but uh, Eclipse Foundation's been running in production for several months uh, for the eGit and JGit projects that are hosted there. It's a small test area, but still running. Uh, Google runs it internally in production for uh, Android and some other projects I probably can't disclose. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, quite a few other companies are running it in production internally. Sony Ericsson certainly. Uh, I think Motorola is running in production internally. Uh, probably some other companies I can't name, but uh, other big uh, handset manufacturers or chipset vendors that are building millions of cell phone units a year are using it internally for their development efforts. And no big spooky losses yet? No, we have never had a data loss in Garrett, which is great. Uh, we do have some open known bugs, uh, like any software out there. Um, some of them are easily worked around and uh, don't really have a big impact on users. And some are sort of like, well, when this bug happens, the only way to fix it is to restart your Garrett server. You'll kick it in the head. Um, but, you know, uh, restart your server once a week is not a huge deal for most companies. They can manage to schedule the one minute downtime and stick it in a cron job. And so it, it's a reasonable workaround. We'd love to get the bug fixed. I'm trying to get it fixed in the near future here. But, uh, yeah, we never had data loss, which is great. Knock on wood. Now, is the the my actual Git repo is that out visible as a, as a file system, so I could actually use normal Git tools with it as well? So that depends. Uh, it's up to the server administrator who installed Garrett whether he's going to expose the Git repository itself. Uh, you can choose to hide it completely and only make mm -hmm. it available through Garrett. Since Garrett embeds an SSH server with the full Git protocol stack, you can clone directly off the Garrett SSH server and as well as push back through it. And uh, I know some installations, that's exactly what we do. The only way to access the repository is through the Garrett server. Everybody does Git clone SSH to the Garrett server and pull from that and Git push right back to that same URL. It makes it really easy for the users. One URL for the repository for all actions. Uh, some other people I know, like the Android Open Source Project, it's fully open source. Uh, we are sync the repository file system to uh, android.git.cartle.org and we run Git daemon uh, anonymously on those repositories. So you can hit the file system directly in those cases, or at least over the Git daemon and over our sync. Cool. Now, but either way, the, the Git files are actually still in the file system. You just, you just do not have an access method to it. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we store the data in the normal Git repository structure. So you can still run Git FSCK, uh, you can still run Git GC, and use standard Git tools against it. It's just a normal bare Git repository. Is there a chance of, of Garrett getting confused if I start doing too many things with the repo, though? No. Uh, we do have a bug we know about in this area, which is why I hesitated. But okay. by and large, Garrett is as good as regular Git is uh, with regards to concurrent operations against the repository. Uh, Garrett implements the same locking protocols that other Git commands use. So concurrent access goes through the same lock mechanism, and uh, you know one is going to win and the others will get rejected. Um, mm -hmm. If you uh, run a Git GC or a Git repack concurrently with repository access, Garrett mostly knows how to uh, pick up new pack files when they get created and stop looking at ones that have been removed. Or if a loose object gets repacked or gets evicted, uh, it, just like the regular C code, it knows how to work around this. But I think our caching is slightly too aggressive here. Uh, we might be skipping a, a uh, LSTAT on a directory when we shouldn't be. And sometimes a Git GC causes Garrett to not notice uh, the pack file, then you've got to restart the server to, to wedge that out of memory. And I think it's have to go back in and be a little bit more aggressive about statting the file system to make sure we're current. Well, this sounds like a really interesting way to use Git in a good situation for uh, having multiple people work on a project, which of course most Git projects are. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time today to come in and talk about to us about it. Is there anything I left out of the conversation here that you want to make sure our, our audience knows? No, I think uh, we covered the projects pretty well. Uh, okay. Both are great features and are slight warts. <laughs> well, that's important because nothing's perfect. And we just want to know where the perfect, warts are. No. Very good. Well, well, Sean, it's been a pleasure having you on today. I'm sorry uh, Randy's uh, audio got really messed up in the middle there, which is why she didn't ask very many questions. But uh, we'll hopefully straighten that up by the end of the show here. But uh, thank you for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's great. Okay, Eric, you can uh, cut it there. And say bye to Sean. Bye, Sean. <laughs> And did we get Randy back by now, or is what's going on there? Yeah, I'm back. I'm okay. just getting crazy packet loss right now. I need to call my ISP. <laughs> what are you going to call them when you call them? <sighs> Many names I shouldn't be repeating here. <laughs> Well, so that was a uh, Garrett uh, code review. Uh, sorry you couldn't be on for most of that show. Hopefully you were watching it at home, even though you were having bad packet loss there, Randy. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I was able to listen in for most of it. Just kept on getting disconnected. Oh, that's too bad. It's too bad. So um, I think uh, now is what I usually go through. I'm, I'm sort of at a loss now that Leo's not here. It's like, what next? What do we do next? But I have my notes in front of me, so we'll just keep going forward with those. Let me talk about the upcoming guests, uh, some of which you'll be with me to uh, actually help uh, co-host and continue on with this. Uh, we've got uh, next week, I love, this, this is going to be one of the best shows ever. Well, I keep saying that about every show. Uh, but we've got Scott Maxwell and Paola Baluta. They drive the rover. They drive the Mars rover. It's not just any rover. It's a Range Rover on Earth. They, they drive the Mars rover. So they're going to talk to us about uh, how open source is being used at NASA and what it's like, uh, you know, driving something that uh, that is, you know, 30 million miles away or whatever. I don't know. That's probably wrong math. Dr. Kiki's going to get mad at me, but it's some distance away. Uh, we've got Ryan Levengood coming up uh, the week following that from the Haiku uh, operating system. That'll be a fun show. Matt Ray is going to be with us uh, shortly after that, uh, talking about Xenos, which is a uh, administration uh, network management uh, software. I actually saw him speak at um, Linux uh, Texas Linux Fest, wherever I was a couple weeks ago. Uh, we've got a bunch more on the list. If you look at twit.tv slash floss, you can see our upcoming guests. You can find instructions there about how to make a suggestion about what to do that. You can also follow me on as a Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on uh, Twitter. That'll be a good place for, to get a hold of me. Uh, in fact, if you follow me like that, you'll find out that coming up soon, I'll be in uh, New York City the evening of May 1st. So if you happen to be in the downtown uh, Manhattan area, um, uh, follow my Twitter. It'll tell you where I'm actually going to hang out for the evening because uh, I'm starting on a cruise the next morning, which is the reason I'm in New York City. Um, that's about all my plugs. Randy, anything you want to plug today? I got no plugs today. <laughs> No plugs. You gonna give out your uh, your uh, uh, Twitter handle at least? Uh, my Twitter handle is FreeBSD Girl. FreeBSD Girl, the famous FreeBSD Girl. Well, they got I her names got back. I just got my last year. last night. I'm very proud. <laughs> well, I hope you're back uh, frequently again, and hopefully next time the uh, audio works a little bit better for you. Sorry about it uh, falling out in the middle there, but here we go. It's all good. Okay. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, and. Um, That's great. Great, thanks. And uh, we'll see you, uh, you, all the audience out there, we'll see you all next time on Floss Weekly.